Welcome to the Real Trending Podcast, where we speak to the brightest minds in real estate about leadership, growth, business strategies, and trends. I'm your host, Tracy Velt, the Senior Director of Data and Content for HW Media, which includes Real Trends and Housing Wire. Today, I'd like to welcome Pratesh Damani. He is the Chief Technology Officer for The Real Brokerage, and we're going to discuss generative AI and some practical applications for it. Um, so welcome, Pratesh. Well, thank you for having me. Yes. So um, I know we had a little pre-conversation and uh, the Real Brokerage has a new product out called Leo. And I first want to just start with a little bit of information about that, because I think even if you're not with the Real Brokerage, it's just an interest. It's interesting to see what what is being done right now um, with this. So why don't we just first go into that a little bit? That's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, at Real, you know, I joined um, Real via an acquisition two and a half years ago. And um, the goal was to become or, you know, be on the forefront of technology. And um, we found ourselves in a very lucky situation, to be honest. Um, I mean, of course, we have AI. AI is like this loosely used word. Um, Today, it means a little different than what it used to mean last year, to be honest. And we can go into that a little bit. Um, But when we started working two and a half years ago, we made a strategic decision because of our 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 operating margins and our business model that we had to automate quite a bit of our work. So we made a strategic decision to build everything from ground up, our transaction platform, our signature platform, uh, document signature platform, and everything that goes into a transaction. And then came January and like this, you know, GPT generative AI stuff just took off. It was on the, it was in works for many years, honestly, but it just kind of took off and it became accessible to as a commodity, like a database would be accessible in like an AWS cloud. Um, to technology companies. And we found ourselves in a, in a unique position where we had total control over our data, complete proprietary data. We didn't have to house our, we were not housing our data in third-party platforms where you don't know how, what it means and what it looks like and it's not structured right. We had total control over it. And it was the obvious thing for us to do was to put GPT uh, or generative AI on top of our data, which is what we did. So yes, as a realtor, you could go to, Chat GPT, which is a GPT implementation of a company called OpenAI, just to be, you know, it's like saying photocopy and Xerox, right? So Xerox would be Chat GPT and photocopy would be GPT, right? Just um, so, um, and there are many other implementations that are coming out, like Google has Bard, for example. Um, there are a couple other companies, um, Anthropic, that's coming out with a really good implementation. So we're going to see a lot of people like competing in this market. And we found ourselves in a situation where we could leverage these models. Um, and fine tune them to accommodate our data. So it would be easy to just pipe through into ChatGPT and say, well, write me a listing description, right? Um, and there's honestly, there's no innovation there. Like it's just someone else's product. You're just like putting a nice little interface on top of it. But the innovation with us is like, because we have proprietary data that's like, like you know, a house by us, you could literally come to the most complex use case. I'll give you the most complex use case. You could come to Leo and say, where's my money? Now, Leo will understand what that means. It will then understand all the transactions that you have with us, right? And it will say, which transaction are you asking about? And then it will nicely show you the transaction. And then you pick the transaction and it tells you exactly where your money is. Your money has been sent to you and it should be arrive in 48 hours. Oh, we haven't sent you the money because you haven't uploaded the closing documents. Oh, we haven't sent you the money because your deal hasn't closed yet. Like we're waiting on closing. It, But we are using... We are using uh, generative AI for mo- more of its LLM capabilities, like the language capabilities, right? So a push notification typically looks like a uh, transaction ready for review. That's it. But if you put it through an LLM, it sounds like a human being talking to you, like your assistant. Like, so it will sound like, hey, hey, Tracy, you know, your transaction 123 Banana Street is ready for review. Uh, can you look at the tra- commission document and let me know if it's yes, if it's good to go? That whole thing is baked out through the LLM, right? So, or generative AI. And that's what makes it exciting for us. So uh, with Leo, like, you you know, we are seeing at least three to 400 tons of, uh, questions being asked on a daily basis, which is like a, a large amount if you really think about it. And it's cutting down our support by a lot. So it has all our, uh, you know, it's, it's a combination of our proprietary data plus all our help desk and all our learning material, all packaged up 
in a really nice interface, like a fun interface. And it's learning on a daily basis, which is the scariest part. Like, you know, it's exponential growth going forward. Um, and we take it very seriously. So when people ask questions and we have a miss, we know what we have to do to get the answers. So you could go to Leo today and say, give me a W9. And based on which state that agent is part of, because we have the licensing information and it's all like, you know, super categorized in our database, we know which W9 to give them. It's not a search. Right. And that's like the beauty of proprietary data combined with, you know, generative AI. Okay. And I just want to be clear to the audience. So Leo is like a concierge assistant for agents to use um, where they can get information about where their transactions are in the process, get help with different aspects of the business, um, you know, ask, ask administrative questions that they may have had to call someone for um, in that as well. Absolutely. Okay. And is it in the form of like a chat bot or? It is, it is integrated. So our, our core business is technology only. So you, every agent, every real yeah. agent has downloads this app and it's required a hundred percent adoption because that's the only way you can put a transaction in. Yeah. Right. So, uh, on our, on our side, um, you know, we, we, because it's required to download this app, Leo just had like a home. So it's mm -hmm. always present on the top and there's this like wavy line that's always present and, and they can pull it down and you mm -hmm. can talk to it or you can type it in. Okay. Um, and I, I think most agents have heard now about chat GPT and generative AI, but they don't really understand how to use it. Um, I, I think I want to talk about first, just give me, you know, a shortened version of what it actually is and where that data is coming from and maybe a little bit about some of the limitations before we get into the opportunities yeah that's a good question so before we go into we use the word ai mm -hmm. um in all honesty pretty loosely right now uh what does that mean last year the meaning of ai and this year the meaning of ai is like two different things mm -hmm. last year when people meant AI, they meant machine learning, mm -hmm. which is mostly, you know, trends analysis or time series analysis, stuff like that. This year, when they, when people say AI, they mean GPT. Mm -hmm. Like in most cases, of course, like in a more, more, um, um, you know, corner context, there is more context, but like in general, like in popular media, AI would be generative AI, right? Or GPT. So, you know, your question, your question was like, you know, what should be, how does it work? Like, like at a high level, right? Let's just do that. Um, and I like to say this one simple thing, given a series of words, what's words, what's the most likely word to follow? That's it. If you just truly analyze that sentence, you'll know how it works. Like, and it's almost like I have, I have two daughters and like, you know, when I'm, when we talk about English and so, you know, once in a while, they'll say something. I'll give you an example. I had the goodest day at school right now. This is what I'm going to give you an example of reinforcement training, right? So what would I do? I would say, did you have the best day at school? And now my daughter like immediately uses the next time. She's probably not going to say good as she's going to say best. And what I've just done is I've trained her based on my knowledge and I'm tuning her brain to use these samples that I'm sending her. Right? So the brain works exactly the same way as a neural networks. So you're looking at what's the most likely word to follow, but you just train the human beings train themselves with so much data that it's intuitive to you, right? You're not going through grammar rules when you're speaking English, it just comes, right? Same thing with GPT, it's been trained on billions and billions of text, right? Like words, and words but they follow in a specific order and it's basically memorized this stuff, right? So. In, in layman's language, it's memor rogue memorization of the likelihood of the next word. Um, and that's what makes it fun, but dangerous at the same time, because it's literally saying what's the most likely doesn't mean accurate. And this is, like, you know, this is the dicey part of GPT. Yeah. And, and let's go into that um, from a standpoint of accuracy, because I think a lot of um, people think they could just ask it a question. It gives them what they want and then they can use it. Um, but there really is more involved in that. 100%. So there's a word that's being used right now called hallucinations. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just a kind of a made up word in a funny way. But um, when it came, became mainstream, they needed to, like everybody needed to explain to everyone else, like what's, what's the made up part? So they mm -hmm. use this word hallucination. So what does it mean? Going back to what, how does GPT work? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. what's the most likely word to follow? It doesn't mean the most accurate word to follow. It just means the most likely word to follow based on the training set, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So you could use it and it probably, you know, depending on the exercise that you're trying to do, you could have good or bad answers. So Mm -hmm. let me give you an example. Um, You could say, create a listing description for one, two, three banana street, right? I will probably come up with like a reasonably good listing description, right? But you know what's really happening is like the the person who's asking for this listing description knows how to validate this information, adds color to it saying, oh, this listing has a garden, can you rewrite it? Oh, this listing has a pool, can you rewrite it? And what you're really doing is like you're doing this refined question asking, but you, but the best part is that you're able to validate the response. And that's, I, I would say like the number one thing to do is to validate the response. So if you asked it a question that you can't validate, I would be very careful about using that, you know, because like it could be wrong and it could put you in an embarrassing situation, right? So. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've heard a lot of, um, you know, like fair housing issues and listing descriptions and things like that, where you really have to read them carefully to make sure that um, they abide by all the code of ethics and the laws. So. So you bring up a very good example, right? So fair housing rules, mm-hmm. chat GPT specifically, I think is trained on all information before September, 2021. If, mm-hmm. from, um, if that's the case, if any change rules, you know, might not even be memorized yet, yeah. right? So you're definitely getting old information. So that, mm-hmm. that makes it tricky, right? So again, like also that's the other aspect to know. It's like what, how much information has been indexed? And there is no visibility on what information has been indexed either. And do you know, I mean, when will they update that? When will they, is that something that they're working on? How does that, how does that work? Well, I think this is the tricky part about, about these models. Um, A is we don't know what information that they have used to, to actually build in the, build it in the first place. Right. Right. Uh, what, like, you know, I know that there are corpuses out there um, that, are freely available, like Wikipedia is like probably 60% of chat GPT, to be honest, like, right? So, uh, but then there are these fine tune, and then there is reinforcement learning, and then human, humans sitting on top of it, training and making sure, you know, there is some level of sanity to what comes back and not inappropriate stuff and stuff like that. So updating this is like not an easy exercise. Um, but again, what I'll say is like, there are, for every chat GPT, I think there are nearly a thousand models right now out there. There are chat GPT competitors. Some of them have no human reinforcement. But they are all, they're coming pretty close to what chat GPT is doing, right? So I think Google's competitor that will come out later this year um, is going to be near real time, which might be kind of interesting. But internally, when, when we started analyzing it, we almost pre- like bet like put a bet or predicted that by the end of the year, I think the model, the open source models that are like, you know, commercially usable will probably be as good as ChatGPT. And, and um, you know, I was at a presentation and I thought it was really interesting how they, they compared it to kind of your iPhone and all the different apps available because um, there are, you know, all these new apps that, that kind of narrow in on specific applications of ChatGPT. Um, you know, are you seeing any that stand out in real estate or, um, you know, ones that seem interesting? Yeah, I think it's exactly like the iPhone situation where there are gimmicks and then there are some real use cases, right? Mm -hmm. I think, I think Chad, like GPT on its own is already mature enough where, um, where it does quite a bit for you. Let me, let me give you an example, like Excel, Microsoft Excel, for example, it doesn't have to do too many things. It just has to do one thing right. And it becomes an incredible tool. Like Microsoft Excel, like, you know, the one number one thing they did was they they perfected financial modeling, mm-hmm. right? And every and then there was massive adoption. And, and then it just keeps adding on, tacking on new features, right? Yep. Same thing with ChatGPT. I think I think the add-ons are good, but the primary use case is so solid. I, I think I think generative AI in general, because generative AI, again, ChatGPT is text based, which mm-hmm. is one modality but there's obviously the video and the audio use cases as well right mm-hmm. uh yeah, so video is the same as imagery because like many images equals to one video right so so i think there are some practical use cases there right so 
Of course, you have the basic chat GPT use case, but then you take a photo and the sky is not perfect. And you can use generative AI to like fill up the sky, right? Or uh, you have a house that you want to sell, but there's no staging in it, right? Like back in the, literally three years ago, you would have to buy staging furniture, put it in, take photos, right? And now you can like literally just take an empty house and stage it with one click, right? Like what kind of furniture do you want? You pick like, you know, the different uh, eras or whatever, like, you know, modern or like eclectic or whatever. And like, it just puts this furniture in for you and almost like does a pretty amazing job at, at it, right? So there are these early use cases. So I wouldn't, you know, so I would, there are some practical use cases that are very useful and like things that used to cost you $400 will probably cost you $2 now, which is like a real thing. I think next year is going to be interesting because you will be past the gimmicks, right? Like, you know, like the ratio of gimmicks to real is probably one to like one to 99 is my guess right now, right? So next year will be interesting because all the early, like the easy low hanging fruit is taken and now you have to do the advanced stuff, right? So if I were to bet um, a lot more customer engagement and lead nurturing, like those two things, right? So from a real estate agent standpoint, you're talking about you're talking about how do I engage my existing customers and give them an amazing experience while not doing it myself, which is what AI is for. Um, and then lead nurturing. Imagine you have a database of ten thousand people, and AI just like like generative AI can you know call an API, get a house, know your criteria, get a house for you, and send it out as if I sent it to you and engage. And if, you, and if you do engage back, then I warm up the lead for you and I hand it over to you, right? I think that's like really powerful, really scalable, and truly like, you know, gets you to a point where, where, it's, where it's actually like changing your business and like, you know, net ROI. Yeah. I also heard of a use where you could basically um, export your database into a CSV file, upload it into chat. GPT and then ask for it to analyze for similarities or, um, you know, different, different ways to connect to people and find out like maybe you have 10, um, 10 past clients who all are interested in baseball, for example, or something like that. And then you can target your emails to them in that way or target your communications to them in that way. Um, I thought that was interesting as well. So definitely interesting. I think like customized email, you know, targeting like, hey, I found this home that's like perfectly fit to your target. And like it's written up as if it's a custom email. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I think I think the challenge with those those add-ons and and those approaches are like at scale you can't you you can't check what's written up it's just going to go in your name so again it goes back to what we were talking about like hallucinations like are you willing to take the risk like i don't know i i feel iffy about like i'm i'm better with mail merge than generative ai writing my emails for me and putting my name on it and sending it out and i have no idea what i sent out like I think that would be embarrassing for me, but but I also understand that with leads, you know, it's it's a numbers game at the end of the day, right? You get text messages all day, like you know, with random stuff, right? So this it's pros and cons, like everything else in the world, I think. Let's talk about some brokerage applications. So as a broker or a team leader, um, obviously uh, you're doing the concierge assistant. Um, what are some other um, you know, application specific applications for brokers. It's an interesting. It's an interesting question, right? So, so I saw this graphic, and maybe I can send it to you after the after the recording, mm -hmm. where it's like you know the graphic talked about like, hey, so there are these two people on the table, and like you know, a, a business person and a and a technical person. So the business person goes to the technical person, hey, I heard about this thing called ChatGPT, should be implemented. Uh, the technical person goes, yes. The business person goes like, do you think it will, like, it has privacy concerns? The response is probably. Do you think it has, like, you know, a brand issues? Like, probably. Do you think, like, it could, like, you know, cause some negative customer feedback? Probably. Should we implement it? Yes. I think that's, I think that that's where everybody is, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say, like, if, you, if you're a broker, um, investing thousands or millions of dollars into a technology, like you got to figure out what your differentiation is, mm -hmm. right? So, 
rather than me answer, like, you know, trying to give you ideas on like, you know, what brokers should do, like we mm -hmm. wouldn't do it. I'll tell you what we wouldn't do. We wouldn't do it if we didn't have the proprietary data because it's gimmicky. It's yeah. just like passing the question to chat GPT and taking the response, putting it back in mm -hmm. or, um, you know, there's no value add, there's no defensibility. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but however, if you do want to throw some AI into your technology, then, you know, feeding your FAQs or your help desk could be a low hanging fruit, right? Again, we've done this and we know that it's not that simple. It's not just like, let's feed this in and it's going to, it's going to spit back out like meaningful things. Like we had to tune so much. It's, it, you have to have like this obsessive mentality around this or else you're going to get wrong answers. It's going to like piss off a bunch of people. So, uh, because people, people come to you and just like, we've seen things where people just say, what's up with the one, one, two, three banana tree. That's the question. What's up with one, two, three banana tree. When we launched it, we wouldn't expect people to ask that kind of question, right? We would ask people like, where is my money for one, two, three specific things. Right. But, uh, so, so again, like going back to low hanging fruit is like, just plug in your help desk and, and, um, you know, anything else you've got that's static. It will probably engage your, it will probably engage your customer base a lot more because most people, if they have questions, they, they don't go to help desk. You can have your help desk. You can have your FAQs. Nobody goes there. Like that's just the reality. Very few people like statistically significant, right? It's easier to send a support email that will then send you the link to the help desk than to just go to help desk and search for yourself. Right. With us, what we've done is like, we, we've, we've made it so accessible that it's almost more work to send to support than to ask Leo, right? And then what Leo does, it, it actually has a fallback. So when it recognizes I couldn't help you, it says, do you want me to create a support ticket for you? So it's smart enough to like do it for you. So it's less work to create a support ticket because all your conversations, your background, your transaction, it's all packaged up nicely and sent to support. So it works really well. But my advice to others would be, um, you know, be careful about what you expose, right? Because it could, it could push back on you a little bit, like with like false information or hallucination, but the low hanging fruit would be your help desk. I would think maybe training might be as well. If you kind of uploaded all the transcripts from your training videos and had kind of a training center, something like that. that yeah. Yeah. I agree. Like, I mean, at real, we have like real Academy, which is the same thing. Mm -hmm. The, again, the challenge is always going back to, is it going to meaningfully respond to a question? Mm -hmm. Right. So we've, we've experimented quite a bit. Can it summarize the training? Can we transcribe a pro podcast and, and do something meaningful with it? Mm -hmm. The results are sometimes dicey and we don't, we're very careful about like how we present. So mm -hmm. we ended up like amalgamating, you know, um, language models with interface. So, so what does that mean? Like when you say, Hey, can you help me with objection handling? It understands the true meaning of your question, no matter how you ask it. How do I handle objections? Can you help me with objection handling? What's up with objection handling? Or can you help me with objections? No word handling, like very different ways. Like, like the beauty of LLM is like, it understands the meaning, not the sequencing of your questions. With that, what we're able to then do is like surface courses that they could take to actually truly learn instead of trying to answer the question. So we are using LLM in a different way. Okay, that makes sense. Um, what about with agents? What are some practical applications um, for agents? Uh, maybe, you know, obviously listing descriptions is one, but what are some other things that they can be using it for? Well, I think like from a prompt standpoint, right? Like, um, of course, you could get the right creative prompts, which is the mm -hmm. listing descriptions that you mentioned, right? I think there's like this advice piece, which again, like, you know, be like, you have to be careful with what comes back. Mm -hmm. Right. But you could, you could ask for advice, like, Hey, how can I improve? Like, you know, my negotiation skills with like in this situation. And it will, it will give you some ideas that you can think about. Right. Or you can do like instructional prompts, right? Like, which is, uh, how do I conduct a virtual tour for this address? And this, like, you know, mm -hmm. you could put some scenario in and you could get some, some good advice on that. Uh, or you could even do like role play, which is, which is probably the most effective one I've seen. Like when you tell the LLM, you are a, you know, an interior designer and, um, help me, help me come up with points that would increase the resale value of this home in this address. Again, like, remember, like it's going to make things up. 
it doesn't truly understand the address. It doesn't truly understand the geolocation. It doesn't understand that the property on like, you know, Miami beach compared to a property in like Orlando is two different things completely. So, but it's going to probably give you the same advice or, or nearly the same advice, right? It's, I would use all these, all of these as like a starting point as like a launch pad for you to get creative, right? Like that's, and again, like if you search the internet, there are like probably thousands of articles about like best prompts for real estate. Um, but I think that's my general advice on, on using it effectively. Yeah. Um, you know, I found that it's, if you're inputting the information, it's your data, like you said, that you get much better. Like if you have a property and you um, have the MLS data, copying and pasting that MLS data in there, rather than just putting the address will give you a little bit more accuracy in that description than just saying, write a description for this property. 100%. 100%. The more context you can provide, the better results. And and there are there are prompt techniques that you could use saying, don't use any external, you know, yeah. like you can say, you can load up the prompt, mm-hmm. to say, don't do X, Y, Z. And then you can have a, a list of all the X, Y, Zs, right? Yeah. Uh, and that we've seen effective but it can't you really still it the way it works is very weird right like it you can't force it to mm-hmm. do anything so um you know it's still a lot of experimentation but i think like 2023 was more about hey here's this new technology and i think we've knocked out the basic use cases and next year is going to be evolutionary where yeah. where um really challenging ideas will come out mm-hmm. and uh, uh really challenging um yeah you know um decisions will have to be made i'll go i'll go back to your question about you know advice for brokerages right mm-hmm. um or brokers i would one of the biggest thing i would say is privacy and copyright those two things right mm-hmm. um privacy is what information you're sending over right and are you comfortable with that and you just have to kind of make that decision and and the other one is copyright so going back to, and this is like an unsolved problem right now, right? You just have to be okay with the risk. So the billions of, like in my earlier, you know, when we were talking about before, like the billions of text that was used to feed and train the GPT, there is active cases right now where people are suing open AI um, on, um, you know, copyright infringement. Honestly, I think it's derivative work. And derivative work has exceptions, right? Like it's like saying my... My kid, like, you know, referencing E equals to MC squared or something is like some kind of infringement or, uh, or my daughter referencing like a Disney movie is like some kind of infringement. Like, I, I don't think it is. Um, and I think that's where the challenge is going to be. It's an ongoing challenge. Uh, but I, but I think it should be reasonably safe, but you have to know that you're making this decision, right? And this is where housing your own models is a training your own models and housing your own models, right? So. Um, instead of sending the questions to chat GPT or open AI, if you're housing your own models in your own infrastructure, then you, you've got the privacy part covered, right? There are many open source models that work really close to open AI. So I do some exploring there. And, uh, in terms of copyright, um, I think it's an open question. There's no verdict, right? Like it's an open question. We'll see how it goes, but I, I highly doubt like anything can like maybe open AI is responsible, but I highly doubt a realtor using it is responsible, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that there are several legal challenges and right now there are really no um, limits to, to anything that you're doing um, using open AI or chat GPT or any of the generative AI. Um, what are, What is your kind of like outlook? Do you feel like in the next year there's going to be some more parameters around it or? Yeah, I think I think what will happen is this is the most challenging part because for innovation, you if you, the United States is a pro innovation country, mm-hmm. um, so you have to push the envelope and you have to truly understand like who is it benefiting, right? If we don't push the envelope, are we competitive as a, as a country in general? It's like that's how I think about it. Yeah. So um, I think it will be pro GPT. So I'm not worried about like the constraints put on it. Mm-hmm. There might be some disclosures put on it, similar to what happened with Google search. When it came out, it was indexing left and right, everything, right? Mm-hmm. And then we came out with like the robots file, which told Google, instructed Google what you can and cannot use for 
search indexing. Mm -hmm. Same thing is I can see a, a, a day when there's a file dropped on your website saying, don't use my data for training your models, right? Right. That's, an, that's a proactive instruction to some third party. Um, the only difference is when Google indexes something, you know, the results are shown and that's just what it is. Like, you know, the, here the issue is that it's training material. It's like me reading a textbook and then paraphrasing it in work that has nothing to do with that textbook. Like that's the hardest part here. So um, I think like my gut feeling is that there will be major sources of data that will charge companies like OpenAI Open to train their models with their data. Um, Twitter, for example, might do that, right? Uh, Stack Overflow, there's another company that might do that. Um, and then there are like the smaller players who might let it happen anyways in exchange for a link back to them, right? So there's some, there's got to be some middle ground. And I think, I think if a year or two from now, I can see it being realistic where you get an answer and the sources are listed like a research article. Right? Um, but the way this technology works, it's kind of hard to list the sources. So there's like, you know, some middle ground there. Okay. Um, my final question is just what's next for the real brokerage um, technology wise, not necessarily even with generative AI, but um, you know. Well, we are very focused on, on delivering on our, on our consumer vision, right? Like we, like we built all this, all this technology so that we can make the home buying purchase, like of the process easy. Mm -hmm. So for us, the obsession is that most of our investment goes into, into like building the future. So what we have today is table six is what we call it. Table six, mm -hmm. like, you know, do transaction management platform. We built our own signature platform. We built our own within our transaction management platform. We have, we home grew our own Slack, mm -hmm. our own, you know, Asana, if you know Asana or Trello. Yep. So we kind of home grew all of that and we bound that into like an amazing platform that's seamless, right? Mm -hmm. But what we've really done is we built those infrastructure pieces and now they're all, now we have like almost like an exponential growth on terms of technology because we can use these pieces and build other blocks, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is public information, but in October we'll we'll launch our first iteration of our consumer app. Um, and our goal is like when when a, a buyer is working with an agent, all they want is a home. They don't. They, everything else is noise, is nuisance. If you really think about it, talking to anybody, getting a loan, getting a title, half the people don't even know what title is. Um, you know, insurance, like everything is a nuisance. They just want to walk into that home. And how can you make that a fun process? And I know many companies have tried this. We're going to also try it, right? So we'll see how successful we get. But like, this is our obsession. Like we've, we've figured out our table stakes. We're already in a place where features where, that we do now are nice to have. Like our business operates, it runs. Of course, we'll like, you know, we'll do what we have to do. But like our we're betting the house on on building an amazing consumer experience. And and Leo will be part of that. And that's the best part. Like the consumers will be interacting with Leo, a seamless way to talk to agents, a seamless way to talk to your loan officer, a seamless way to talk to your insurance person. Everything board up nicely, RESPA compliant and all of that good stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I can't wait to see it. So um, Pratesh, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge on uh, generative AI and the future of the real brokerage. I really appreciate you joining Real Trending. Well, thank you for having me once again. That was fun.